on, separated them by thousands of miles. I don't know, even know how they did this, but when they stimulate the wave properties of one, the other responds instantaneously. Hmm. And it turns out that water does the same thing. You can take water that was formerly a glass of water, separate the water into two pitchers, and then expose information to one pitcher of water, and regardless of distance, the other one responds instantly. Huh. So it mean, what it means is there is something conscious in water, in hydrogen. There is something in spooky action at a distance that shows us how we can circumvent the speed of light limit, and that there's a way to communicate instantaneously anywhere in the universe. And this starts to get into the problem of we don't see anything in real time, anywhere, not even in front of our face, meaning the speed we see everything at the speed of light, which is not instantaneous. It's mm-hmm. moving at 186,282 miles per second. That's not instant. Right. So when we look at Andromeda, it's 2.2 million light years from here. We're seeing as it was 2.2 million years ago. The past, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're seeing the past. Even our own sun, we're seeing it in the past. So spooky action at a distance gives us a clue of where the real-time universe is, and it turns out that consciousness, especially a particular type of consciousness, knows exactly what's going on in the real-time universe. So Hmm. you think of the matrix, and you think of coming out of the matrix, how... All of the ancient Hindus called the world the Maya, the illusion. Right. And you think in the beginning of the movie, The Matrix, you see Keanu Reeves opens this little box and it says Simulation and Simulacra, <laughs> which was a book written by uh, Baudelaire. Um, I mean, a really incredible book, which really shows us how we fabricate our Maya, our illusion. We create a web and a trap to to bind ourselves to... And the economy, the economic trap, and the economics of, of trying to sustain ourselves and our, and our lifestyles mm. is so overburdening, people don't have the time to think about consciousness. They don't have the time to meditate three hours a day like I did right. um, for 30 years because their goal is to pay for that house, is to pay for the mortgage and the car and the fuel and, and, the, and, the, and the wife and the kids. And it, turned, it, it used to be sustainable. I remember because I was born in you know, 1961, that my parents bought a house for $20,000 and you could pay your mortgage off in about 10 years. Right, right. Hmm. And now, and with one person working, with only the husband working, my, my mother took care of us and she made clothes for us and we, lit, we had this great lifestyle and, and my stepfather was a science teacher. And then you see today it takes two people to barely make it work, yeah. just so you have just enough. So <laughs> what society is telling us, they don't want us to be free of the matrix. They want to bind us to total slavery. Yeah. So films like From Here to Andromeda challenge that, and the idea that if we attain this technology, because I'm going to go back to your, your question here, you know, do we gain knowledge by going into these fields of awareness, and right. do we get the answers? Well, it turns out that most of the people, like Einstein, who you know rode his bike around Princeton University, was a massive genius. He spent all of his time in meditation and deep thought on how the universe was working. And I really believe he went into these super expanded states of consciousness. And and so did Nikola Tesla. And you know, and there's many many great thinkers right. throughout history, all over Europe and the Americas. And and what you find is the people who who changed the world the man who invents the light bulb and, and the motion picture, Edison, these people were in states of meditation that were so profound that in these states they have these epiphanies or revelations. Mm-hmm. And the reason they get them is they go into these, you know, nine greater rings of consciousness. Anybody who pierces the seventh would be... I mean, historically, anybody who crosses the seventh becomes fully realized, and their aura is so luminous and so powerful. There's really, it's really hard to miss it. Well, David, the Dalai you, Lama tells us that he is not enlightened by the Buddhist definition. He has not attained nirvana, but that doesn't mean he doesn't go into the, some of the greater super-expanded states of consciousness, you know, the, the six um, lower rings of enlightenment beneath that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because nirvana crosses the seventh and eventually goes into the eighth and the ninth, which I give this spectacular tour of these rings of awareness in the film The Voice. Mm-hmm. So 
ultimately, you know, when you look at conspiracy theories, you look at how much we're being oppressed, the ultimate thing that people can do is learn how to meditate every single day. And I guarantee you, no drugs, you sit there and you do this practice like I've been doing every day, within just a few years, I mean, I started having super mystical experiences in the first year Mm -hmm. that I was practicing. And having traveled to India and all these different places, I've designed a series of meditation lessons, uh, one called Deep Relaxation Meditation, one called uh, Insight Meditation Level 1, which there'll be a Level 2 and a 3, and um, then I'm going to be teaching people the, the deeper levels of meditation called Singularity. And then I have seven energy centers breathing meditation, and they're only five dollars as downloads on voiceentertainment.net mm. forward slash store. So, you know, I'm making this stuff really cheap for people. It's like you know, it's the cost of a beer at a bar. You know, you can get a, a a meditation lesson from somebody who has been doing it for thirty years and has translated all the Greek and foreign terminologies and you know made it very simple for, right. for Europeans and, and Americans. So. Right, because there's, again, there's so many different practices to kind of go through, and, and have you kind of developed your own, or have you kind of uh, picked and choose by, you know, those who are out there? What, how did you do it? Well, what I did is, having attended many intensive, you know, yoga, um, y- yoga learning uh, processes, therapy, emotional release, and different types of sitting meditation. There's all these different techniques from the Far East, and I found that a lot of the terminologies and, you know, people, when they start learning all these different Sanskrit terms in India, you know, these things, they have a certain sacredness to them, to their culture, but the pure state of mind, you don't need to learn any of these terminologies. You just need to learn the core practice. Right. Arthur C. Clarke, the, the, the science fiction writer, said the world's perf perfect religion would be purified Buddhism. That mm. means a the practice of Buddhism purified of all of the terminologies in the foreign languages, just the core practice. And one of the things that happened to me is in the very beginning, like that experience I had in my dad's retreat, it was, you know, I was, it was my first intensive, and I, in a way I was very innocent, in nine, and I think it was 1982 or 81 when I did that retreat. Mm-hmm. I think I might have been 21 or 20 years old uh, when I come to think of it. And I didn't have my mind bogged down by all these books that I read about meditation. I just sat there and I did this simple practice. And I had this enormous experience. But what happens is when people become very knowledgeable and they have all these terms and all these ideas floating around their brain, it makes it hard to meditate. Yeah. Because you're, you become attached to you know, the different terms and different stages of meditations and all these different mantras and prayers. Right, and right. You find that ultimately meditation is about you. It's not about worshiping any guru. It's about knowing your own self in God consciousness, or you can just call it the field. You don't even have to name it. The, the, the universe's intelligence ultimately is way beyond name and form. Mm. So the meditations I've designed are, are like Arthur Cooper. C. Clark said they are purified Buddhism, Hinduism, mystic Christianity. They're very simple, but they're very deep and they're very effective. Mm-hmm. And I found that there also there was a lot of terminologies and ideas about non-attachment and attachment, and you have to do this if you want to get to this state. And I found that a lot of those were mistranslated from the Buddhist and Hindu into English, and can be disastrous if a mm-hmm. person goes down the wrong road. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, non-attachment is not really, it doesn't mean you push everything away in your life and you become this aloof person. It actually means the opposite. It means Non-attachment in Buddhism is neither a clinging nor aversion. You experience everything, completely human in every way, mm-hmm. but with the awareness that everything is constantly changing. And therefore, no matter how profound of a blissful experience you may have or, or a painful experience you have, you experience it with the awareness that this is going to pass, it's mm. changing. So your your non-attachment is more, it's not about pushing anything away in your life. It's right. experiencing everything with awareness. Right, so. because, yeah, exactly, because many people actually, uh, they try to, you know, radically change their life in that way, that they're, okay, now I shouldn't be, you know, materialistic, all, you know, all stuff is <laughs> evil, basically, and they push that away. But, but, but again, this is not about 
This is not at all about what is going on in the external world because this is only an internal thing and, and you could, can still live a life as a normal, you know, regular human being but still have an internal peace and knowledge about what is going on in the world, right? You know, you're exactly right. Like The thing about materialism is, is really tricky because if we say, I'm going to become anti-materialistic, then you were going to push everything away and I'm going to be like living in a cave or a simple apartment. Right. But you're 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 now you now become attached to that and you're pushing something away which is creating what's called a polarity field matrix. It creates a duality. And dualities in in meditation we realize they waste all of our energy. All seven of our chakras are energy centers in our body from the base of the spine and these energy centers, I'll describe them very quickly, but mm -hmm. you don't even have to believe in them, and you really know they're there. We have our sex center at the base of our spine, and our sex center goes into conflict about sexuality, who we're attracted to, am I going to be rejected by this person or accepted by them, um, am I going to allow this feeling to exist in my body or not. That That's the conflict that goes on in the sex chakra. Mm -hmm. The next energy center is where your belly button is, and this is where we were connected to our mother's womb for nine months and our father's energy. That is our life force. That's where we feel either connected to life or rejected by it. And we have dialogues about the conflict of, you know, am I accepted in this social situation or am I rejected? So that center wastes all of its energy in conflicts of that nature. And then mm -hmm. the third center is where our adrenal glands are in our liver. It's in the, you know, right in the, beneath the rib cage and the sternum. That is our adrenal, our motivator energy center. So this is where we feel either engaged or motivated to do something, or we feel passive, like, no, I don't really want to do that, or if I start this business, someone else is going to go to business and they're going to com compete with me. We, that's where our motivation energy center is. Right. The next one is the heart. We either feel loved or we feel rejected. We either feel connected in the heart center to a person family, community, or the world, or, or the universe, or we feel rejected by it. And the idea of rejection and acceptance itself is a waste of, of energy. And then we go into the throat, which is, of course, where we communicate. Our vocal cords are there. And then above that is the space between the eyebrows is where we visualize all of our stimulus. This is where our visions take place in our mind's eye. Mm. And the top of the head is the universal connector center. So what's amazing in the film The Voice is a Russian scientist named Konstantin Korotkov who had a near-death experience. He has several PhDs in physics. He developed the world's first three-dimensional human aura imaging camera and software. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It can take a picture of your entire auric field, but not just for a visual curly and photography effect. He can actually measure the information coming out of the light waves from your, what are called our biophotons. Mm -hmm. Biophotons were discovered by a German scientist named Fritz Albert Popp in 1974. He proved their existence in 1976 and that they were coming from the DNA. Right. So our DNA is transmitting light, and that light has information. It has your memories, your consciousness, your thoughts, and that information gets shared in the collective field of the universe, in the actual atoms that are surrounding our bodies, in our bodies, and, and throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. These atoms are actually recording and storing all the information that's being transmitted off of all living things. So now that Pot measured the existence of biophotons and their information, Konstantin Korkov's camera can read the information in your auric field. Mm -hmm. And this is very useful, what we did in the film The Voice, we showed five meditators, all of our seven are energy centers. We, the, the machine can actually see how much energy is coming out of your heart center, how much is coming out of your belly, your sex center, your universal connector center. And it was amazing to measure our chakras before and after meditation. And some of the meditations were 45 minutes, one hour. Some of them were half an hour. Some of them were, were almost three hours. Mm -hmm. But you'd see this enormous in in increase in energy coming out of the energy centers, which you can really feel. Like, you don't really need the machine because you're really feeling it, but it's amazing to see that it's really there. Right, right. It's not your imagination.